Coming up on DTNS, Apple may stop bundling headphones with their iPhones, why new U.S. trade rules might not affect Huawei at all, and can AI help us find a vaccine? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We had a wide-ranging good day internet today. If you want to hear us talk about Patrick Beja's accent, A&W root beer, ice cream, and more, get that wider, expanded show at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Xiaomi reported Q1 revenue rose 13.6%, beating expectations. The company says smartphone production in China has largely resumed and demand has rebounded. Sales rose thanks to rising prices for 5G phones and growing overseas sales as well. Speaking of phones, Verizon is turning on 5G uploads in some of its 5G coverage area. That means Verizon 5G customers will see uploads that are 30% faster than LTE. Up until now, Verizon's 5G service only delivered 5G for download and still used LTE for its uploads. AT&T is rolling out actual 5G, but of course, as we've talked about on this show, also calls their LTE 5GE or 5G evolution, but they might not be doing that for long. After the National Advertising Review Board, or NARB, recommended that AT&T cease using the term as well as the phrase 5G evolution, the first step to 5G in its marketing material. The company says it respectfully disagrees, but is a supporter of the self-regulatory process and will comply with the decision. Last month, AT&T added 90 new markets for a total of 120 million customers across 190 markets with access to actual 5G that they can just call 5G for customers who have actual 5G capable phones. I love that. We respectfully disagree. We will comply, but I guess we're not we'll going to say how. <laughs> Maybe you'll just forget. The SD Association announced the SD 8.0 memory spec for SD cards. SD Express card transfer speeds quadruple to 3,940 megabits per second with support for PCIe 4.0. To get those speeds, SD card readers need to support two PCIe 4 lanes. Other slots with PCIe 3 can still get twice the speed at, at 1,900 uh, megabits per second. SD 8.0 cards will be backwards compatible and available across a range of sizes. The spec will allow reasonable transfer speeds for up to 4K and 8K video, as well as faster game loading as well. SD cards using the 8.0 spec are expected towards the end of the year. Twitter acknowledged that they are indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, testing a new setting among a quote unquote limited group that lets users control who can reply to their tweets. Users can pick from one of three options, everyone, people you follow, or, <clears throat> or and only people you mention. If anyone outside the chosen setting uh, or, or if you're outside the cho chosen setting, you can still view the tweet, uh, like and retweet it, but you can't reply directly to the sender. The tweet thread will also include or indicate that replies have been limited. Google's letting existing Google Fi customers use eSIM now on their iPhone 10R, 10S, 10S Max, and 11 series or 2020 SE phones. Those are the iPhones that support dual SIM. Uh, new Google Fi customers have been able to do this since last month, but it was because they were setting up from scratch. The Verge notes that some users on Reddit report that you need to uninstall the Google Fi app from the iPhone, then add a cellular plan to the iPhone, then reinstall the Google Fi app, and then it'll work. Ride hailing company Didi said on Wednesday it will use AI to verify if Latin American drivers are wearing masks and have disinfected cars. Drivers will have to take a picture of themselves wearing the mask starting on May 22nd. And starting in June, they'll need to report body temperature and upload photos of daily vehicle disinfection. Passengers will also be required to wear masks. And Didi launched similar measures in China back in January. All right, Scott, tell us the good news about Apple. Well... This is maybe good news for some, or maybe we just expect this. We'll see. Analyst Ming Chiku believes Apple may not include wired headphones or ear pods in the next generation of iPhones. Heaven forbid. Ku says Apple may uh, heavily promote or even discount AirPods. She does not believe or expect new models of AirPods until 2021. Wired Apple headphones cost 29 bucks right now, and the lowest priced AirPods are currently 159 even if you get a deal occasionally at 139 which is what I did. Um, I... Uh, I'm not surprised by this. In fact, 
I'm also not surprised that it's probably going to be Apple who pulls the trigger and finally says, hey, no more wired I, I, uh, earbuds in here. However, I kind of wish they would just make earpods real cheap and have those in instead. I know they're not going to do that, but that would be really cool. That's truly the bridge to the wireless future, not this sort of half measure with not including it at all. Well, you mean you mean you know to to bring down the price of AirPods to something that would be less well, of you know something that you have to swallow if you want to buy a new iPhone. I mean, the whole thing about the AirPods, the wired AirPods, is you know people. Uh, made a big stink when they got rid of the headphone jack. But it was like, okay, well, I'm still getting them for free, right? You know, might be a dongle appropriate. Once you get a phone that, you know, has a has a, uh, a lightning port, then you've got that. But, you know, in general, it's hard to really complain too much if you're getting earbuds that work for free. If you want something better, you get those separately. Mm. Apple being like, possibly, no, you don't get them at all. But we'll maybe offer AirPods for something drastically reduced for a short period of time because our ner our new version of AirPods aren't coming out till next year kind of thing. It is interesting. And I wonder, you know, people will be up in arms as they always are about how things change. But I wonder how this will end up driving a lot of sales for AirPods. Ming-Chi Kuo is, is usually right about this stuff. Uh, so I'm not going to be surprised if this happens. I would imagine that Apple will reduce the price of the AirPods Maybe uh, below a hundred dollars uh, for not the pro, right? But but for the entry yeah. level, and then bundle that in. So in other words, you can buy the iPhone, or you can you know get really cheap AirPods for less than a hundred dollars with the iPhone, and they'll push that when you're checking out. Hey, do you want to add AirPods for this super cheap price? Uh, they're really going. To, I think. From Apple's side, granted, you could look at this and say Apple is cheap and they want to make money off accessories and they're trying to force you into spending money on accessories. That's a perfectly legitimate point of view that I know a lot of you will hold. The other side of this is Apple looking at this and saying, look, we don't want to put in stuff that people aren't going to use. And if people already have AirPods or already have headphones, wireless headphones that they like that aren't AirPods, uh, that's what we want them to do. That's why we got rid of the, the headphone jack. And so why would we put in this piece of plastic that's going to go to waste uh, when everybody in our audience anyway is switching to these wireless headphones and we want to push that adoption because then those headphones can be used on multiple uh, phones and you're not making a bunch of headphones that nobody's going to use. I'm just saying, imagine the box and you open it up and there's the phone and then below that you got the little tiny manual and below that, two ear pods just laying there. Oh, then no. I'm yeah, saying imagine the box. This is what Apple wants. I guarantee it. Imagine the box. You open it up and it's the phone and that's it. Wireless charging, wireless headphones that you get separately. Uh, you, they don't want anything else in that box except the phone. I think that's their goal. Uh, speaking of Apple, Apple and Google have made their exposure notification API live for the public. Uh, so health agencies can now use that API in their apps for Android and iOS. Companies say many U.S. states, 22 countries have been provided API access already and more to come. This is phase one, if you remember. This is where the system works in apps. So you have to download an app to make it work, but it still has all the privacy protections, doesn't use geolocation and all of that stuff. Phase two is the one that will work at the operating system level and not require an app in order to start uh, collecting the data. Google and Apple are in conversations with public health authorities about what system level features would be useful in that second phase. Interesting. Do we know, um, I mean, this isn't that big a deal for for users, really, because we're not we're not going to see anything right away. I mean, we're not going to see anything that takes. Well, if if, to if you're in North Dakota, they're going to have a, a an app that takes the advantage of this, separate from an app they already have out that uses geolocation. So if you want the the bigger privacy protection, you'll be able to opt for that. Utah's not going to have this. Mm -hmm. That health agency is not. Uh, playing along with Apple, Google, but uh, keep an eye on your health agency so that they will tell you when their app is ready to download uh, or update to take advantage of this. I got to say the rollouts of this, and I know that there are many stages and we're still at the very beginning. The companies have been really good about messaging and they've been really good about delivering, uh, you know, on dates that they've promised, if not sooner. 
And with that, we will move on to shopping. At Shopify Reunite, Shopify's first virtual version of its annual event, I believe this was the fifth year, the company unveiled a new business account and debit card option for customers called Shopify Balance, a buy now, pay later option called Shop Pay Installments, and a new local delivery product. Shopify says its AI-powered fulfillment network is also actively accepting merchant applications. Now, if you remember our story from yesterday, on the competitor side of things, yesterday Facebook announced Facebook Shops, a tool to help businesses list products on Facebook pages and Instagram profiles. Now, right now, Shopify, uh, you know, it reaps the rewards of Facebook rolling this out, but it just goes to show you. And again, it's our to our our. our our current climate right now that that leans heavily into this whole idea of, all right, let's do a little bit more of you know that kind of consumer to consumer shopping situation, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, Shopify is getting more robust and and Facebook uh, Shops is getting a lot of attention. Yeah, I, I think. Facebook shops, honestly, I, I know you're saying that Facebook will, you know, and it, it makes sense to say Facebook will eventually want to just take this all away from Shopify. But I don't know whether that's true. I don't I think Facebook likes the idea that they can leave that complex business of setting up inventory and tracking inventory and taxes and all this stuff that you may not may not realize out there that that Shopify, Big Cartel, Woo companies like that do, uh, the Facebook isn't an expert in. Uh, they they want those companies to take advantage of that. They're happy to let Shopify take advantage of that uh, and then put that sort of things like Shopify balance, buy now, pay later into the Facebook shop because where Facebook's going to make the money is offering a, a simplified payment exit plan that Shopify can plug into, uh, but also every Facebook shop operator can then advertise on Facebook to get the people on Facebook to come to the Facebook shop and shop in the Facebook. I mean, I, I think Facebook is the mall operator here, not the cash register operator. And Shopify is the, you know, back of office accounting cash register operator. And, and the mall doesn't want to get into that business. What could happen, though, it's very possible if that cash register really rocks the joint and does amazingly well, there's no reason the mall, in this case, Facebook, might not be interested in picking them up and buying them. So yeah, that's entirely Westfield possible. might buy Omron is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> not impossible. Uh, and, and in this case, I think even more likely than that, that scenario, that's a good point. Yeah, and they buy all kinds of little things that, that mm. work well or, or jive well with what Facebook's goals are. And sometimes that's not exactly clear, but this seems like a clear one to me. It's one of the only missing aspects of the kinds of commerce you can do on Facebook is a more integrated solution for you know, front end and back end. So, and the reason they bought Giphy is they wanted that data. The reason they might buy a Shopify, more data. Yep. Get you know, I, 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 a couple of friends I know who run small, uh, we, you know, we want to sell you our t-shirts type of thing all over the world. It's like, it is, there has been a conundrum for a while. Shopify is not the only option, but it's kind of the only option unless you're going to build out the back end yourselves and that's really complicated and definitely a little too big for the britches of a lot of you know small folks who are who are setting out that said i also see all the time people who i don't know i follow on instagram let's say and every you know 10th time they post there's something that they're sort of selling and i'm like i would just wish this was less clunky like i get what you're doing i don't even hate you for it just you know give me something a little bit more streamlined so i understand what's going on so i think that facebook shops is is designed to to uh to solve that issue yeah uh, HBO Max launches on the 27th. Many of you have already signed up for their cheaper deal, but gives you HBO plus a lot of other content from Warner Brothers Media, TNT, TBS, etc. I hope a lot of old uh, WB cartoons would be great if they could do that. Anyway, Warner Studios is also involved in this, DC Movies, for example, and HBO Max Originals. It costs the same as HBO alone at $14.99, same as you're playing for Go if you're doing that. If Warner reaches a deal with a cable or streaming device platform, you may automatically get HBO Max. If you're an HBO subscriber, deals have already been announced with Apple, Charter, Google, uh, YouTube, TV as well. Wednesday, May 20th, Warner announced uh, deals with Atlas. Uh, let's see. Alt, that's Altice. Altice. Sorry, Altice. Uh, Cox, Microsoft, so think Xbox. NCTC, smaller cable operators. Samsung, Sony, so think PlayStation. And Verizon. The big, or sorry, the three big names without a deal yet are Amazon, Comcast, and Roku, and they're big names. Variety says Roku and Warner are close, but Amazon is not likely to happen. 
Oh, and Dish Network hadn't or hasn't had regular HBO since November 2018, so there's that too. Um, I'm personally confused as someone who has a really good phone plan with AT and T because <laughs> I think I'm supposed to be getting it free, but I'm paying for it, and I think that's my fault, but I'm not sure because they haven't really explained it. So there you go. You're one of those yeah. people, everybody. They, we didn't they, mention AT and T, which owns Warner Media. So right. any AT and T service will also be included in this. Also, you didn't mention Hulu. Uh, Hulu will be part of this. If you're on any of these folks with with paying through the platform that Scott mentioned are having the deal, you probably won't be confused. Uh, May 27th, you'll get a notice that says, hey, guess what? You have access to HBO Max now as part of your HBO Now subscription. Isn't that great? Uh, but if you're on uh, uh, Roku, uh, if you're on one of these others that is that does not have a deal yet, uh, Comcast uh, and or Amazon, which never will have, then your HBO Now subscription will stay HBO Now and you'll have to figure out uh, well, do I want to get HBO Max? What platform can I get it on? Like, it sounds like you won't even have HBO Max apps on any platform that doesn't come to a deal. Here's the here's the wacky thing about all this. Uh, I got three different emails from HBO. One that was just like a regular, hey, look what's on HBO Go this month, because I'm an HBO Go subscriber. And then I got one that says, hey, you should join HBO Max because we're going to do it for 11 bucks or whatever for the first year if you get in now and you can cancel anytime. And then I got a third email that duped that one because it was a different email address. So because I've got email addresses in different places, <laughs> probably a whole separate one at at and I'm getting like eight messages of, of different you know, options. And I, I won't even get into the fact that you keep saying HBO Go, which you can only use if you have a cable subscription to HBO versus HBO Now, which is the one that you buy standalone when you don't right. have a cable subscription. Which is actually the one I meant, which adds to this confusion. <laughs> You're totally right. You're totally right. All right, folks. Uh, Wall Street Journal and The Economist have both reported that several trade experts out there believe that the new U.S. trade rules that we mentioned earlier this week may not end up affecting Huawei, the company that they were written for. The new rules say that any company using U.S.-made equipment or designs to make chips need a license if they have knowledge that the products they're making are destined for Huawei. So it, there's already a, an entity list that Huawei is on that says you can't sell to Huawei. But the loophole that the U.S. was try, trying to close was companies saying, well, we're not selling to Huawei. The chip maker is. So they said, look, chip maker, even if you're not in the United States, if you're using equipment or designs from the United States, you can't sell to Huawei. But the complexity of the supply chain means that a lot of chip makers sell to a distributor, not to Huawei. For in the instance, an Indian company named Flex assembles products for multiple companies, including Huawei. Flex could order chips from TSMC without telling TSMC who they're for. They might be for another of Flex's clients. They might be for multiple clients, including Huawei. But Flex would be the buyer and say, TSMC, we need this many chips. A U.S. Department of Commerce spokesman told the Wall Street Journal, quote, intermediate steps in the supply chain are irrelevant when there is no mystery as to the ultimate destination. Clearly there is, though. But what if there is? Exactly. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's sort of like, OK, do we put this on Flex and TSMC at this point? Well, the two of you need to have way better communication so that ultimately stuff doesn't land in the hands of Huawei, the company. I mean, both of those companies are going to be like, no, we have that's how the supply chain works for us. That's we can't do it any better than this. And an now, Indian you, company, it would be in its rights to say if if the U.S. is like, well, you need to tell TSMC who these chips are for. The Indian company could say, why? I'm an Indian company. I don't need to. Do, I don't need to follow your rules. Which would mean then the Department of Commerce would have to write new trade rules to try to close that loophole. Uh, this may not end up being a problem. It may be that TSMC lawyers look at all this and go, well, it's it, it is probable that you know that these are destined for Huawei. So you know, you better not say the chips. Uh, this is not one where we have a conclusion for you. It's it's watch for the headline that says TSMC cut off uh, supplies for sure. TSMC has not admitted that. There's been headlines alleging that, but TSMC says, no, we're evaluating. Uh, look for the headline that says TSMC absolutely has done this or an absence of that headline and a story coming out later saying, yeah, Huawei seems to be shipping just as many phones because of this loophole. And you will know what that loophole is now. Yep. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day, be sure to subscribe to Daily Tech Headlines. You'll get them in about five minutes at dailytechheadlines.com. 
Ray Kurzweil has an opinion piece in Wired advocating more use of artificial intelligence to speed up vaccine research. Uh, he identifies the two main parts where he thinks AI could help. One is identifying the right molecules that a vaccine would target, and two, hold clinical trials. Uh, so what artificial intelligence can do is say, look, there's billions of possibilities, trillions of possibilities for molecules out there, uh, but we can try every single one of them against COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, the actual virus, and see if they match up. Uh, and we can do that much faster. You know, the humans could never do that. And, and AI could do that because it can do some pattern matching. Or, uh, and I should say, it could say, okay, we have a physiological model. We've trained machine learning to know uh, how people respond to various molecules entering their system. So we can simulate the clinical trials and kind of eliminate the ones that very obviously would cause a problem. We'd still hold the clinical trials, of course, but, but we could toss out a few and, and save us some time by identifying the ones that wouldn't work right away. Now, humans come up with a few dozen possibilities out of a trillions, test a few hundred humans to see what works. <coughs> AI would test trillions of possibilities and thousands of simulated patients. Argonne National Laboratory doing this. Kurzweil predicts, given the exponential nature of progress in this field, I believe by the end of the decade, we'll be able to realistically model all biology and simulate interventions for diseases. But we need to evaluate Kurzweil's claims. Uh, Sarah, tell us what Alex Engler has been saying. Uh, okay, so on April 20th, uh, Alex Engler, a uh, professor who teaches data science over at Georgetown, studies implications of AI, wrote, artificial intelligence won't save us from coronavirus. And he has a few identifiers of ways to avoid falling for sp uh, specific AI claims. He says- so Specious, specious AI claims. Spe so, so, so we're looking for claims that are out of the ordinary. Uh, and, and what's great about this is it's two wired articles here. Uh, we went straight to, to the article uh, that Alex Engler posted on the Brookings Institute. And I figured, okay, let's go through Kurzweil's claims here uh, and, and test them against Engler's uh, system. So is he a subject matter expert? Well, I'm going to say yes. Does anybody disagree with me? Kurzweil is an AI subject matter expert. Yes. Yeah, yes, he's absolutely. All right. He's not a company that's just applying AI with not knowing how it works. Right. Uh, AI needs a lot of data. Does the relevant data exist? Well, the, the, the data on the viruses e exists. Uh, so that part isn't questionable. What's questionable is do we have the right data to understand how these molecules will interact with humans? Well, I, can I use this example you used before the show where you made me feel smart for one, uh, not for once, but for today, you made me feel very smart. You make me feel smart all the time, Tom. But <laughs> I basically said, look, there are, where my head starts to get into the weeds on this thing is how complicated the human testing can be because there are so many of us and right down to individual levels, you can have different results depending on what you're looking for. This kind of research seems like it would be hard to emulate with an AI when what you really need is a whole bunch of flesh and blood bodies across a huge range of pre-existing conditions, uh, medical conditions, uh, age groups, races, everything, all of it, all those factors. And I couldn't wrap my head around how an AI, AI like this or any other that anyone would talk about would be able to do that. And you made a pretty good point about that. Um, so there, I've set you. I've I've tossed the ball to you. Now. you tell me <laughs> what, what was you're the saying. point I made again? Well, uh, <laughs> well, no, but but what you're what you're looking at is would a healthy individual uh, likely have a, a a very negative reaction to this? Uh, and you can you can model that sort of behavior, and machine learning can look at patterns and say, oh yeah, we, usually when we see this molecule, that causes adverse problems. Is that is that what I was getting at? Yeah, and the idea is that it's in my head. I had a kind of a narrow view of how much an AI could do, but your point was all of these are just points of data. Yeah. Like at some point you gather, if the, let's say there are 2 trillion um, variations in, in, a, in a kind of biology we need to have as part of this study, it's capable of having, taking that data and then working with that data. And in my head, I was thinking it was just too big, too complex. I think Kurzweil's whole point is we will get to the point maybe sooner than later that it won't be that complex. It won't yeah. take that much He's, time. We'll he like he is advocating, let's use AI to narrow it down. He's not advocating, we don't. We can skip 
human trials or anything. Sure, sure. Uh, another one of Engler's points is beware accuracy predictions. They may be skewed. I don't think this applies to Kurzweil because he's not saying an accuracy prediction in this case. Uh, but it's it's worth bearing in mind when you're evaluating AI claims. If 90 of 100 people are healthy and an AI detects six unhealthy people, it can claim 96% accuracy because it said, oh, 90 are healthy, right. six are unhealthy. But it's missing 40% of the unhealthy people, because it only detected six of the 10 unhealthy people. So you you have to be aware how those numbers can be massaged. Yeah. I mean, I love uh, it itself. It's an actual, uh, this is so Kurzweilian, if that's a word. He says, given the exponential nature of progress in this field, I believe by the end of the decade, we'll be able to realistically model all biology and simulate interventions for diseases without the need of human trials. Like if that is not uh, He's, yeah, Kurzweil, yeah, that's like he is him, saying but... that will happen in ten years. Uh, Kurzweil likes to say he has an eighty-six percent uh, success rate of predicting things. Other people uh, take issue with that, uh, noting that in fact we did have a, a bust, uh, and he predicted we wouldn't have one, uh, and uh, you know all, all that. He, he he missed the dot-com bust among other things, uh, but. I, I, he's not saying we need that now. He's saying we do need AI to help narrow it down. Uh, also, Engler says real-world deployment generally degrades AI performance. So even if it's good in the machine, it won't be as good in, in public. So keep that in mind. I don't think that hurts Kurzweil's case here. Uh, you must enable an intervention to really matter. That's built in. Where well, the intervention is you actually are going to create a vaccine and you're going to do clinical trials. Uh, AI is good at minute details, not big events. In this case, that's a positive to Kurzweil. He's saying, I don't want to pick the trends of who's going to get the virus. I want to come up with this minute thing uh, that will cause the virus to go away. Don't forget, AI will be biased. I think that is a big problem with vaccine research, is that you will be training it in the human side on data that will be biased. It's very difficult to find unbiased data out there that treats all humans equally and will work with everyone. But I guess if it works in some humans, it's likely to work in most. So uh, that, might be, that may not be fatal to this. And the future of AI systems is more promising. Uh, and in fact, Engler cites AI-designed drugs starting human trials as an example where AI is doing well. So overall, I, I think Kurzweil's prediction in this case passes the Engler test fairly well. Maybe between now and then, we build an AI that can predict whether Kurzweil's predictions are going to be correct. <laughs> and then we can make another AI on top of that that will predict Let's train a machine learning algorithm on Kurzweil's past predictions and results. It's a great yes. idea, Scott. That's good to work yeah, on you that. can't just train him. He's only one person. That's right. right. <laughs> well, you are all one person yourselves, unless you're, I don't know, some other beast. But you can join in the conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All are welcome. Let's take a look at the mailbag. Oh, let's. This one came in from Tim. Tim Tim has an interesting conundrum. He says, we live in a small rural mountain community of about uh, 1,800 folks. Recently, a broadband research group acquired money to install a tower that would significantly boost access and speeds to our community. They identified our property as the best location to place it. They're offering $200 a month lease to us in perpetuity for land use, and then 50 megabits down... Haven't stated what's up, but at least 50 down for life complimentary. I'm considering countering with the above, as well as saying I also want a hard line into the house, as well as having access to their highest available speed at all times. What are your thoughts? Should I consider other things before agreeing? Because they want to begin soon. Uh, well, Tim, I would say get a lawyer. Uh, if you're if you're signing a long term per in perpetuity uh, lease for land lease, you, lease, you need a lawyer. Uh, to look over all the ins and outs of this. I would also say uh, it can't hurt to counter that. I, I think saying, look, I don't want 50 megabits per second down when eventually you'll have gig down. I, I want the highest speed available that you can possibly ever give me in perpetuity. It's It should mm -hmm. always be the top level. I think that's fair to ask uh, for that. I mean, because otherwise they're nickel and diamond you. So first of all, get a lawyer to make sure that there's nothing else in the lease that they could use to to weasel other things and and yeah second counter for a little bit of a better deal I and if there's a, yeah if anybody out there is like i actually went through this something similar oh, yeah. where i knew somebody who would please let us know feedback at dailytechnewshow.com because i'm i'm sure the whole kind of like but this is good for the entire community is one of those things where it's sort of hard to say no because you've got some pressure of the people around you potentially sure 
Shout out to patrons at our master, uh, master and grandmaster levels, including Jeffrey Zilks, Ken Hayes, and Brad Schick. Also, thanks to the one, the only, Scott Johnson. Whoa. Scott, what I know, I know, it just keeps getting better every week because we're so excited to have you with us. What's been going on over the last week? Well, thank you uh, very much. There's a, there's a very prominent rugby coach in Australia with my name, so I'll share it with him. That's fine. Um, okay. Hey, uh, so uh, there's lots of stuff going on, but I want to focus on one thing real quick, and that is uh, for the next two weeks, there's only two weeks of it left. For the five full weeks of uh, May, we've been giving free art classes to kids. Uh, my daughter and I, we come on a Saturday, we stream it, and we tell everybody, uh, you know, get different things that we can work on and do, and they all do it at the same time. They send us the art, we put it in a gallery. It's a lot of fun and a great way to keep your kids occupied for a good hour and a half on Saturdays, and it costs nothing. So if you want to be a part of the last two weeks, we're going to focus on character design and art. You can head on over to frogpants.com slash art class. All the details are there. Previous sessions are there. You'll also find those galleries I mentioned and everything you'll need if you decide to be there. So grab your kids, bring them there. Kids from zero to 99. You can be as old as you want to do this thing if you want to, but we're having a lot of fun with it. We're going to miss it when it's gone. That's this Saturday at uh, 1 p.m. Mountain Time. Check out the details at frogpants.com slash art class. We are uh, taking suggestions from folks in our audience to share the love to projects they love. Uh, and longtime supporter Paolo wrote, would you be willing to help this project get over the line? It's from a friend of mine, a great artist, and it would be amazing if you could help. Sofia Ribeiro's new album, Casa. Uh, Sofia writes on her Kickstarter, I have 12 new songs and I will make a quarantine album accompanied by amazing musicians who will record from their homes. Uh, the best part is, we put this in the lineup. Paolo is one of our patrons who has access to see the lineup, saw that we put it in, and noticed uh, that the Kickstarter went over the line after we put it in the lineup. Whether it was because patrons were seeing it there before we even mentioned it or not, I don't know. Uh, but you still might want to uh, share the love and go check it out. So we'll have the link in the show notes or just search, search Kickstarter for Casa Ribeiro's new album. Nice. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love your feedback. Keep it coming. I say that every day, and I really mean it. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And when I say join us live, I mean that too. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hope you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>